Sorry for the delay there. Um, thanks for coming out. My name is Ben Feiss. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Penn Mention Planning Committee. Um, we're very excited to finally be hosting this kickoff event um, for Penn Mention, which will officially be starting next semester. Uh, applications are going to open up on January 14th, which is the first day of classes, and they're going to close on February 12th, so you have about a month to submit your slides. Um, to help us get started, uh, we're delighted to have Jen Groover here with us tonight. Uh, Jen is a serial entrepreneur who's gone from guest hosting spots on QVC to inking deals with some of the industry's biggest heavyweights. Her success began with the creation of the Butler Bag, the world's first compartmentalized handbag, and has evolved into an entire lifestyle brand, um, which can now be found at several prominent retailers. She's also behind Leader Girls, which teaches young girls the importance of empowerment through play, and her new, newest brand, Empowered by Jen Groover. She is also an author, speaker, and media contributor. So please welcome her. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. It's great to see you all here. I know that you're here by choice and commitment to your own personal growth, and I applaud that. And um, I was supposed to be having about a two-hour time period to share everything with you, so now I have about 35 minutes, so I'm going to talk really fast. I hope you guys can hang with me. Um, we're talking about innovation and success, and uh, my journey is something that is was not expected. My journey just happened to grow upon itself. I didn't have an ideal, ideal childhood. I didn't have many of the opportunities that some people have. And my journey was that of determination to be successful. And I think that without acknowledging persistence and determination while we're talking about success is doing a disservice. My journey as an entrepreneur began right out of college. And I always joke it's because I didn't want somebody to say that I could grow as fast as they said I could grow. But I wanted to grow as fast as I wanted to grow. And the only way I knew to do that was to be an entrepreneur. And I really had no idea how to start a business, but what I did know is that I was really passionate about fitness. And that was in 1995, when the fitness industry was really just beginning. So there wasn't a clear path for somebody to build a business in the fitness industry. And so entrepreneurship is really about somebody finding their passion and innovating in a space or in a way that's unique to them, sharing a message in a way that's unique to them, or sharing a vision or a business model. For me, I had a different idea around how I wanted to do the fitness industry. And I started as a national level fitness competitor with Reebok on the aerobics performance team. And then I also started a business in Wilmington, Delaware that was more of a personal training, country club-like environment for successful people. And the part I really wanted to innovate is that at that time period, corporations didn't have any incentive for proactive health care, preventative health care. And so I started actually creating workshops and incubators within corporations to teach people how to be preventative in their health care choices and create a better lifestyle so that they become more successful. And back in 1995, that was a really enormous leap of faith for people to buy into. Now we know it and we live it and we don't even question it. But back then I really had to convince people about this belief system, this paradigm. And so much of innovation is about how, really engaging people in your belief system that might be different than what they had already thought of before. And getting people to potentially see your perception or your belief system as, as something that's possible. And so with innovation, we often have to show people what exists before it actually exists. And that can be really frustrating. And that can also make you feel defeated pretty quickly and therefore backpedal on a lot of that determination and persistence that I say is extremely critical. So I really wanna focus tonight on what the psychology of success is, the belief systems around success, because no matter how great your product is, no matter how much education you have, if you do not believe that you are capable of being successful, if you don't believe in yourself, how are other people going to believe in you? And I recognize that throughout my entire journey as an entrepreneur, that I was constantly challenged. I evolved from the fitness industry I was overtraining and overworking for too many years, believe it or not. And I found myself with what was called, called oxidative stress. 
Back then, they actually didn't have a name for it. Today, it's called oxidative stress, which is basically when lactic acid builds up into your system so much that it starts to attack your organs if it doesn't have a way of, of releasing itself. The be best way of releasing itself is through antioxidants, which were nowhere near the level of grade that they are today, and through massage, which people thought was just a pampering kind of thing back at that time. And so through that challenge, that life challenge, that physical life challenge, I realized I quickly had to change my path and direction, but I didn't have a B plan by any means. I thought I was going to be doing that for a very long time. But I had to quickly assess, what are my talents? What's my passion? Why am I really here in the fitness industry? And I realized my real passion wasn't so much about the fitness, but getting people to see their potential, getting people to want more for themselves, and really helping people to unlock that for themselves so that they could see success in every aspect of their life. And I had a lot of clients that were women who wanted to start businesses who would always say to me, wait, you started a business right out of college, please teach me how to do it too. And I would do it for fun at that time period until I realized, wait a second, I'm giving all this knowledge and information away for free. And that's how I transitioned from a fitness coach more to a business life coach. Many of those women had incredible ideas, but what they didn't have was a belief system in themselves. They had a lot of education, they had a great foundation, but they didn't believe that they were worthy of that success. And what I was really doing for them, without even realizing it so clearly at that time, was helping them believe in themselves. Many of those businesses became multi-million dollar businesses on QVC. And I evolved from that moment to consulting with QVC. And something about QVC that many of you might not know, which is really fascinating, is people sell products on QVC on an average of $5,000 per minute. It is an incredible business model, and it is a very clear formula that they have created and perfected over time. And so people within QVC saw that I was doing so well with bringing all of my clients' products to them and helping them grow their businesses so they brought me into this think tank that basically any time a product wasn't performing and succeeding at the highest level, $5,000 a minute or more, it, we took it into the incubator to really evaluate why is this not working? Is it the price point? Is it the colors? Is it the value proposition? Is it the person on television with it? Is it the sound bites that they're saying? And we really have to, to pick apart the psychology of why a product was working or wasn't working, or why the person selling the product wasn't working. And at that time, I was so excited to see all this innovation. And I had my own idea journal that I would write in all the time. And it grew and it grew and it grew. And I kept thinking someday, I'll invent my own product. And I kept watching other people turn their widget ideas into multi-million dollar products. And I kept thinking to myself, why are they doing it? Even though it seems like I'm living large right now, even though it seems like I'm living to my potential, even though I'm doing cool things, why are they at a whole different level than me? And I'm helping them get there. How is that possible? I'm hiding behind their success. But why are they succeeding and why am I not at that level? And I realized something that changed my entire life. As I reflected, my father, speaking of Veterans Day, my father was a Marine. And he raised us with this belief system that failure is not an option. Well, when you teach a child failure is not an option, a smart child will do everything that they can to do everything that they're naturally good at and never, ever try anything that they potentially could fail at. And that's exactly what I did my entire childhood. I did everything that I was really good at, that I knew I could succeed at. And I stayed really, really far away from anything that I sensed fear and failure in. And so while all these other people are succeeding, and I seemed like I was doing well, I knew I was not maximizing my potential. And I had this one idea that I really believed in. And one day I was reading Fast Company magazine. And I was reading about these two guys that started the same idea, and it turned into a billion dollar company. And I thought to myself, 
They stole my idea. And then I thought to myself, wait, I'm kidding myself because they actually executed the idea. And am I going to live my life and at the end of my life say to my kids and my grandkids, well, I was really smart. I had all these great ideas in my idea journal. Other people just executed them. Or was I going to actually be a role model for them and walk the walk, not just talk it? And I created a mantra for myself in that moment that I have more fear of regret than I have of failure. Because I realized my fear of failure was the number one thing holding me back from being successful. It wasn't my drive. It wasn't my determination. It wasn't the lack of resources to be educated to figure things out. It was my belief system in myself. And that is why most people do not reach their potential. Their fear, fear of failure, fear of rejection, and fear of abandonment, fear of ridicule. All of those things, they're actually false illusions that we create for ourselves, or blocks that we create for our own potential and our own ability to achieve a high level of greatness, because we all have the potential to do that. But once I created that mantra and I said it to myself every single day until it became who I really was, at this moment when I face something that I might be a little bit fearful of, I get excited. I get really passionate because I know that I'm going to grow and evolve from that moment, from that challenge. I don't see fear as a negative thing. I see it as something that helps me grow and evolve. I changed my entire relationship around that word or that knowledge or emotion. And interestingly enough, at that time period, I had an opportunity to prove my new belief system. I had newborn twins, and I went to the grocery store, and I'm standing in line, and I go up to the cashier to pay. And as I put my girls down in their car seats, both of them begin screaming, crying simultaneously. And I'm panicking because I'm holding up this entire line of people and I could see people rolling their eyes and looking at their clocks. And I'm thinking to myself, seriously, as far as innovation has come in our society, we as women are accepting a bucket for a handbag. Literally a bucket, I could put lining in it, water and a mop and it's a bucket. So as I'm digging for my credit card in panic, this idea, this notion strikes me. And my mom had a mantra that she lived by that I have now adopted that if you are going to complain about something, you better back it up with a solution or you lose all rights and privileges to complain. I did not like it at all as a child, trust me. However, what it taught me to do is think in a point of innovation constantly. When I have a problem that creeps in my mind, I instantly go to the solution. Isn't that the... The, the, where all innovation starts is seeking a solution, correct? So I teach my daughters and everyone that same mindset of you are not allowed to complain about something until you do something about it. So as I'm walking out of that grocery store that night, I'm thinking to myself, what could I possibly do about this? I'm not an engineer. I really can't draw even a good stick figure. How could I possibly design something? Imagine what all those FIT students are gonna think if I call myself a designer. And I went down this whole limiting belief system path that most people go down. And I shelved the idea at that time. Six months later, I was unloading my dishwasher. And I had the bird's eye view of the knives, forks, and spoons. And I'm looking over it and I'm thinking, that's exactly how I want everything in my handbag to be, compartmentalized. So I have a bird's eye view, just like I do with the knives, forks, and spoons. And I, like any sane person, took that dishwasher tray out of the dishwasher and I stuck it into the handbag that I was using at that time. And it was literally like the greatest aha moment where it was like music coming out of my handbag. And I thought, this is it. This is what every woman wants. And then I thought to myself, oh dear, I don't even know where I would begin. How could I do this? I know nothing about handbags and designing and, and patenting and all these other scary things. But that began another journey of proving this having more fear of regret than failure. And I reminded myself of that every single day as I took the next step into that journey 
figuring out how to get something patented, figuring out how to bring it to market, figuring out how to get Oprah to talk about it so it became one of her favorite things. And so when I launched that company, I didn't just make it about my own personal goals. And a huge lesson in, in business is that if you always make it about yourself, your success for your selfish needs, there's not enough emotion to, to go forward as, as if you had a bigger, grander reason outside of yourself, a greater impact for other people besides yourself. And so I also read at that time that women, although they were starting businesses more rapidly than men, were still only 2% of the wealth, creating the wealth. There was very few million dollar companies from women. And so I thought to myself, I'm going to use my business as a symbol of financial success and freedom for other women as a role model. And I'm going to make this a million dollar company in the first year of business. Now, if you say that to anyone in the fashion industry, they will surely look at you like you're absolutely insane. But I didn't know enough to know that what I was saying was so insane. So that's where ignorance really is bliss. So I began this journey with this goal, this very clear goal. And whenever you want to achieve something, make it very clear and as concise as possible. And that will set you on the path. Even though you don't know in that moment how to achieve it, it will set you in the right direction to achieve it. With two weeks left of that first year, I turned that business into a million dollar business. And it was an incredible symbol for other women to achieve that same level of success that quickly. That moment became a springboard for me for so many other things to follow all of my dreams and literally take those ideas out of my idea journal and bring them to life. And really show people that creativity is an unlimited capital. The most unlimited capital that you have, your creativity, your ideas, your innovation. And when you can actually bring it to life, you can impact and change the world. And that's where the powerful notion of innovation is. To know that even though innovation in a handbag and creating apartments isn't life changing, in a small way it was. It made women's lives easier. And more importantly, it became a symbol of the American dream for other women. And I used that business as such. I used it as a model to create impact for other people to start their businesses. And we hear impact investing all the time right now. And I was at the Forbes Under 30 event, uh, Under 30 Summit last week, and it was incredible to see all this innovation and all this success. But the one common thread that I heard out of every single person's mouth was their desire to create impact. And that's what propelled them forward, even in those moments where they would hit roadblocks. They made it about uh, their reason bigger than themselves and about other people. And so when you're beginning a journey of entrepreneurship, if you can actually recognize that entrepreneurship, innovation, is really a journey of self-transformation, you will become the greatest at what you're doing. You can maximize your potential in that mindset because you realize that you have to call yourself out on all of your self-limiting beliefs. You realize that your fears have to be faced in the mirror every single day and that every time you come against a roadblock, you need to figure out how to get over it and not allow it to defeat you. And that fear is only part of the process on the journey to success. Failure is only part of the journey to success. There is no such thing as failure except when you stop and you give up. That's the only failure that exists. And when you embrace that you need to jump over your inner roadblocks in order to easily get over the outer ones that the world creates for you, you see how transforming your life becomes and your journey. And it's not just about taking a product and bringing it to market but it's about your own evolution. It's about your own ability to be the greatest version of yourself possible. And that is where the greatest life fulfillment comes into play. And a lot of people think if I achieve a certain level of success and I have all this money in the bank and I have this kind of car, then I'll be happy. And if you talk to some of the 
most successful, happy, successful people, they will tell you that that's not the truth. The truth is when you can find fulfillment in waking up every single day and that you can't wait to get out of bed on Monday. I see all these posts on Facebook and other social media platforms about, oh, it's Monday. And I think to myself, oh my God, it's amazing. It's Monday. I can't wait. I'm so excited to start my week. That's what living is. That's what life is. That's how we should all feel every single day. That we're excited to start our day. That we're going to do really cool things. Not, oh man, if I could only fake a stomach ache because I don't want to go to work today. That's not living. That's not how life is meant to be lived. But the principles of success that are real about life, success is defined by each one of us differently. And I want to challenge you, before you leave here tonight and going forward, to really begin your journey outside of here, not just thinking to yourself, I want to be successful, but why do you want to be successful? What does success mean to you? Whose lives is it going to impact? So many people say to me, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know what business I want to start. I don't know what I want my cards to look like. It doesn't matter what your cards look like if you don't know who you are and who you want to be. The question isn't what do I want to do, it's who do you want to be. The impact that you want to make in this world, the legacy that you want to leave. In that summit last week, I knew some of those, those people in that room that were 25, 30 years old, we're making incredible impact. And I thought to myself, I wasn't thinking like that at that age at all. And I am so envious in the most positive way, envious that they have. And I wish that I could have, but I can't. But what I can do is at least try to infuse the wisdom that I have at this stage into everyone who I come in contact with to have that type of passion and to embrace those belief systems that will make you infinitely successful and infinitely happy and fulfilled in everything that you're doing. And I know sometimes we hear about success and not having happiness or fulfilled in the conversation, and that is the largest falsehood that could ever happen. And I teach emotional intelligence, and I've skimmed through some of those principles tonight in my stories, because emotional intelligence, the ability to connect with other people is also critical in your success. Um, the ability for you to connect and create human capital, I promise you, is your greatest asset going forward in your journey. Connecting with other people to tell them your ideas, to share your passions, to get them to buy into your passions. Imagine you have this incredible idea but you can't even tell it to somebody because you're not socially engaging with them. You're afraid to communicate it. You're afraid that somebody might say no. But the more emotionally intelligent we become, the more we can actually be successful without as much effort, without as much struggle and pushing forward to try and get people to believe in our idea, ideas. But true leadership is actually the energy that you radiate so that people want to follow you, so that people want to be around you. How many of you have ever met those people that just walk in the room and they own it? They just own it. They might not have the best clothes on, they must, might not have the best education. They might not be the best looking, but they just own that room. Do you know why? Because of their energy. Their energy is infectious. It's contagious. And people want to be around people like that. I will never walk into a meeting without making sure my energy is as high as possible. And I will certainly never pitch an idea until I make sure that everyone in the room's energy comes up to my level. Because if I do, and they're in a bad mood, even if I have a really good idea, they don't wanna buy it from me because they're in a bad mood. So I need to get their energy up to my level in order to be more successful. These are all very small, minor adjustments in our perceptions of how we approach the world and how we get our ideas seen and how we get heard. These minor adjustments make your life a heck of a lot easier. We have control of one thing only in this world. One thing, that is it, and it is our perception. So you can choose to see yourself as the most powerful, dynamic, greatest innovator of the future, or you can see yourself as a victim of other circumstances, 
that people wouldn't want your ideas, that people might not agree with your ideas, I guarantee you, you will be happier choosing the one that's empowered, the perception that you have great luck, the perception that you have the right ideas to share with the world. Because the only thing we can control is that, our own perception. And we can help other people see our perceptions, but we can only do that when we're in a positive mindset. When I was launching the Butler Bag Company, I was trying to get my idea licensed. And I kept pitching this idea over and over again to people in the industry who I was scared of at that time because I thought they had so much more wisdom than me. They knew so much more. And every single one of them said, no, we don't like that idea. We've already tried that idea. Women only want fashion and they don't want function. And I thought to myself, wait, that's really funny because I want both. I know other women want both. What do you mean they only want fashion and they don't want function? And I kept trying to prove my ideas to them. And I finally, after about 20 times of this and that type of rejection over and over again, instead of trying to approve my idea, I changed the energy completely. And I said to the man sitting across from me, entertain this crazy thought just for one second. What if, just what if, they actually wanted both? And it changed the entire industry? And you had a chance to be a part of it? And you said no? and your competitor said yes, then how do you feel? He looked at me and he said, let's do the deal in that moment. Because we're so conditioned to say why everything won't work. But what I did in that moment is stayed firm in my conviction of my perception and I got him to see the possibility of it. I got him to see it being successful versus failing. I got him seeing his competitor making a ton of money off of it and him potentially sitting back thinking, I cannot believe I didn't do that. So getting people to see your perceptions is powerful, but you have to be convicted in your own first in order for other people to follow. I'm going to leave you with one last piece of wisdom. As you go on this journey, there are going to be a lot of people who say no. There's going to be a lot of people that put your ideas down. And that's not because it's necessarily a bad idea. There's a very fine balance in listening to people because they have wisdom and getting their advice, but knowing what advice to take and knowing when to listen to your intuition. Had I not listened to my intuition and I listened to all those people who kept telling me that women did not want fashion and, and, and function, that they only wanted fashion, I wouldn't be standing here today. I wouldn't be doing so many of the amazing, incredible, fun things that I get to do every single day. I would listen to those people's feedback, but I wouldn't take it personally. But I would still challenge it. And I often say in meetings when people say, well, no one's looking for that. We're looking for this. And I'll say, well, no one's looking for the iPod when it changed music industry. No one was looking for Survivor when it created reality TV. And I would get them to see all these things that have become to be that no one was looking for, that were rejected over and over again. So when people are saying no, understand if you're showing them something of innovation, thought leadership, that they potentially just can't see the future and what you're seeing. And often it just takes you to shift to a what if, just like I did. And the greatest what if has to lie within yourself. And when you leave today, I would like you to address that. What is your what if? What is your potential? And how are you going to address it in your expression of yourself and all the things that you create and all the work that you put forward? Because that expression of yourself, your creativity, your innovation, could be the thing that changes an entire industry. Thank you very much. I think we're doing questions. Did you want time for questions? Uh, I'll make sure that you okay. has any questions for Jen, go ahead. I always love to see who the first person to raise their hand is. Um, I was wondering how exactly your bag um, empowers women and um, whether you've received any criticism as to whether it, like, it reinforces 
certain stereotypes of women in the business world or not? And your feelings on that? Yeah, um, so how it empowers women um, in a very simple way is simple, keeping their life more simple, more organized. When you're organized, you actually thrive at a better level. When my house is a mess, I'm not thriving because then that's an ex expression of what's going on in my head. When my bag is a mess, then I'm not functioning at the highest level. So it helps women understand the correlation between being organized and mentally clear, focused. On a bigger, more macro level, for me, the thing that drove me the most is that it was a symbol for other women to know that they can create million dollar businesses. That they can take an idea as simple as a dishwasher tray stuck in a bag and turn it into a multi-million dollar company. That that is the part that I feel empowers women the most. That bag became a symbol of the American dream for women. I want you to think about how many of you can, can just shout out some of the really incredible innovators and game changers of our time. Steve Jobs. Be one of us. Okay, great. People coming. <laughs> We're in an innovation space, correct? <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg. Okay, excellent. Bill Gates. Great. One more. Evan Spiegel. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so with that, that's five names. Did you hear all five names were men? Not one woman's name was said. So. There needs to be a lot more women innovators and role models. And I wanted to pioneer that. I wanted to be that um, so that younger generations, I have 10-year-old twin daughters, and growing up in the environment that my girls are, they actually think every woman invents a product, goes on TV, and writes books. So I want to empower other women to believe that they can do it. And, and that's not taking away from men, but men already have had many leaders and role models. What I wanna do is, is symbolize for women, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't great in school, I didn't have a great childhood, and despite that, I still was able to be successful, so therefore everybody else is too. Great question. Uh, in those moments of rejection, did you ever feel like uh, with venture capital people or uh, who you met with, did you ever feel that you needed to tweak uh, your product, and did, did you make improvements, or did you stick with Overall, I stuck with it, but I did take minor tweaks to my pitch, like the what if. That was, that was a minor tweak, but it really was a game changer. You see, I went from just giving my idea and defending my idea to saying to somebody, what if? And just switching that what if changed everything. He already said no to me, and then he said yes to me after I presented it differently. Um, some of the smaller business model tweaks that were logical, that made sense, I would definitely take into consideration, but I didn't allow them to take my vision away. And that's the difference. Sometimes what entrepreneurs struggle with is getting that feedback. They often lose what their vision was in the process. So I always stay very clear into the conviction of what that product looked like and, and also why it was relevant. What was interesting and something to keep in mind is what I thought my target market was going to be wasn't exactly. I had all these incredible niche markets that I'd never, diabetics were one. I mean, I wasn't a, I wasn't a diabetic. I didn't have anyone close in my life. So I never realized how much stuff they needed to carry around with them that if it was compartmentalized and organized, it would change their life and make them feel like they were carrying something fashionable, not just a functional looking bag. So one thing that I would say as advice is always keep an open mind to who your audience could be because it might not necessarily be who you think it's going to be. Um, did you take this journey alone or did you ask for any help? Because it seemed like this was completely like a slow, like your own journey. Very own. But were you afraid to ask for help? Because it almost seemed like you didn't know where Correct. Sole entrepreneur. Yes, that was me. However, you can't ever do any of it alone. So one of the other lessons that I needed to learn for myself was asking for help isn't a sign of weakness. And I was raised with the belief system that 
asking for help is a sign of weakness. So that was a really hard thing for me to actually start to go out in the world and ask for help. I needed help. I surround myself by incredible people who are smarter than me constantly. And for anyone who wants to go on a journey like this, you have to do that. You become who you surround yourself with. And so I have mentors. I have friends who have accomplished a lot more than me. Um, and I'm not afraid to ask for help. Um, but that was a hard thing for me to learn. And I think gender speaking, that is more challenging for women to do than it is for men. Um, and then surrounding yourself constantly by people that are thinking smarter or bigger than you helps you elevate your game. But there's a journey in that. I'm, I, I might not be hanging out with the same people five or 10 years from now than I am, that I am today. And I might, they might be growing and evolving too. I don't know, but a lot of times we stay in the same circle or cycle of friends because we feel like we're rejecting them if we move on. But in reality, you're rejecting your own personal growth if they're not helping you get to a higher place. I'm not saying use them. I'm saying challenge you in a, in a way that helps you get to a higher place. Um, yes, so when you're in a situation where you, um, you had all these ideas but didn't know where to begin, and then you made the realization that you didn't want to live in fear, like, Initially, after that moment, like, how did your perception of these obstacles in your facing change? Like, what was I say? Like, maybe, like, where did you begin? I guess. Yeah. So that's a great question because that's the root of the psychology of success. So it began by building confidence in that new belief system. So what most people don't realize, and why I love emotional intelligence, and I feel like it's a critical part of every business conversation is if we don't believe in something, if we don't believe in something that we're, ca we're capable of something, or if you, if you saw somebody on a sick, amazing yacht and you thought to yourself, well, that's them, that could never be me, then you've already diminished your ability to ever reach that level of success. And so when you're shifting a belief system, the first step is having awareness of that belief system. So self-awareness is a massive, a massive way to build a solid foundation for more success. So becoming more mindful of your thought processes and where they're coming from, um, your belief systems and where they really came from. My belief systems I shared with you, they came from my father. They weren't my belief systems, they were his, but he put them on me and I took them through life with me. So many of our belief systems or all of our belief systems are comprised of all the people who have been influential in our life, positive or negative. So starting to understand where my belief systems came from was also a critical point in shifting them. Mindfulness and the people I was surrounding myself with and if their belief systems were helping me have greater belief systems or diminishing them. Another part of that self-awareness is to have a journal or a, a, a accountability partner of sorts who will help you see your patterns when you start going into an old pattern, a self-sabotaging pattern, a self-sabotaging belief system until it becomes a new habit. So your old belief systems are a habit. They're a habit of, of how you think. So you have to create a new habit in a new belief system. That's why I said I had that mantra and I'd say it to myself all day, every single day until it became who I was. But when you surround yourself, like I said, have an accountability partner, you surround yourself by people that have a mindset that you want to adopt, having that modeling in place of behavior helps you morph your behavior faster. You gave an anecdote about an investor that initially didn't see the potential of the market opportunity for the product. How did you go about selecting your investor audiences in terms of, were they female? Did they and then once you were in front of the investor, how did you help sort of fill any knowledge gaps that existed? Um, so at that point, as a new, a new entrepreneur, you basically will speak to anyone who will listen, who has money, who will potentially invest in you. Now I know there's very clear groups of investment. Um, I would meet with people who somebody would say, hey, you should meet with this person. They're looking to invest in a new startup. They're looking to invest in a woman-owned business. 
And, and that was really new at that time period too. And that was 2006. So 2004 is when I created the idea. 2006 is when it launched. So at that time period, people really wanted to invest in women-owned startups. It doesn't mean that it was the right person to invest. Um, I wound up, instead of going down a seed round, I wound up doing friends and family so I could maintain control of my company and bootstrapping until that momentum was there. I actually never had to bring in any seed or angel. I, I wound up growing the company. Uh, the first year was one million, the second year was 10 million, and then I licensed it to, to Avon. So Avon basically does all the work and does all the manufacturing and has all the financial risk. If I was to give advice now, having several other businesses under my belt, um, in terms of looking for an investor, don't just look for the person that has the capital, look for the person who can mentor you and guide you and have the relationships to help you get to the next level because relationships are really critical. Who you know is really critical and it can expedite your process of success. If your investor has an incredible Rolodex of people and they basically just call off introductions for you as you are ready for them. And, and that to me, those types of investors, the human capital investors are often more important than the financial because they can get you to the financial. Thank you, Jen. Great. Thank you. So thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, so I wanna say what if Jen had never um, gone from the step when she put the dish tray separator into her bag, looked at it, saw that it worked, and did nothing with it, didn't pursue her idea at all. We wouldn't have the butler bag, and Jen wouldn't be where she is today. So Jen had to go ahead and seek out all the resources, all the money, all the patent lawyers, everything in order to do that. Luckily for all of you guys, we provide that for you. So we really help. <laughs> 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 So we closed that gap between having you know, this impenetrable barrier between having an idea and getting it to fruition to actually getting the resources and everything you need. So the idea here is that Penvention makes it as easy as possible for you. If you have any sort of inkling of an idea, I don't care if you're an English major or a systems engineer or a finance major, you know, if you have any sort of idea for a product and there's some sort of technological component to it, you know, we're making it easy for you. Starting January 14th, basically you put together a five slide presentation, um, basically giving us the idea, how does it work, what's the target market like, you know, maybe some, a brief snapshot of financials and then like who your team is made up of and you submit it and then on February 12th is when it all closes so you have like about a month to do it and Last year we got over 70 teams competing. We're hoping to get even more this year. Um, and basically how it works is after February 12th, we recruit like over 100 judges from all over the world actually. Um, a lot of them are Penn alumni. Um, and we will submit uh, your presentations to them and they will judge them remotely. They'll just sort of go through your presentation and judge it on several different criteria. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll email you the specifics of those criteria um, when we get closer to January. Um, and from that point, you, know, you receive your scores and written feedback, and we've gotten a lot of uh, positive feedback from past competitors that you know, the judges spent time um, looking at the presentations and reading through them and really evaluating them. And from there, we choose about 20 to 25 semifinalists. It depends on the year. Um, and that's sort of where the mentorship comes into play. Right, so um, we, have, we have all sorts of mentorship resources. Um, we have people, everybody from patent lawyers to uh, people, engineers to help you kind of figure out how to make your idea to uh, MBA students from Wharton who could help you create your business model. So basically no matter what school you're in, no matter what you're studying, if you have an idea and you have no clue how to do it at all, how to do the financials or anything, you could just go ahead, come to us, submit your idea, and we'll make sure that you get all the mentors that you need. Um, we have, we've had a lot of mentors in the past. We actually have more mentors than we have people who want mentors. So like, there's definitely the opportunity for you to get 
a lot of different people. So the way it worked last year, actually, um, we had over a hundred different people, uh, again, from across the world, um, and most of whom are Penn alumni. We had a lot of them say that they were interested in mentoring, providing an hour or two of their time. And what we did was ask our semifinalist teams, these 20, 25 teams, you know, what do you need? What do you need help with? Do you need help with, you know, the VC funding aspect? Do you need help with, like, the tech behind software, tech behind hardware, marketing? Um, so we gauged what they need. And then we asked our mentors who are in the industry, um, what are your areas of expertise? And basically, we had this very elaborate matching process um, where you really got customized like mentors who were able to speak to your idea in particular. Um, and last year, we were able to give three mentors per team. Um, and they met some of them in person if they were like in Philly or New York, but a lot of them had phone calls or Skype or emails. And I would say, Across the board, we got extremely positive feedback on the mentorship process. It's probably, you know, the, the defining component of Penvention, um, and it's something I urge you all to sort of take advantage of because it's it's right there. And just to give you an idea of the sort of people that come into Penvention, bring their just their inklings of ideas. Um, so we've had some incredible people submit ideas. So, um, for example, UBeam, uh, they they created a way of beaming electricity wirelessly to charge your mobile device and they have recently raised 10 million dollars in venture funding so her name is meredith perry yeah. she's written up in the new york times over the summer <laughs> um she's at, we're looking to have her come in be either a judge or a mentor um so you know that's one of many success stories right so you know we give you the mentorship and all the resources that you will need to succeed we also give you a little bit of money along the way, $200 to help you develop your prototype um, and, of course, the mentorship that you need for that. And at the very end, everyone will compete for $20,000 in cash and prizes. Right. So, so after the semifinalist stage, um, what you'll do is in about mid-March, uh, the semifinalist will submit a five-minute video pitch of their idea. So you and your team, uh, you know, ideally, because this is a tech innovation competition and we're through the Wise Tech House, which is engineering, ideally you have some sort of prototype of the idea. I think that's a really big step uh, when it comes to bringing a product to market. Um, although it's not required, so by no means should you let that deter you. Um, but essentially you'll create a video pitch of the idea in which you, you demonstrate the prototype, talk about your target market, how are you going to get it out, what do your financials look like, and you'll submit it, and like the first round, we'll have a whole new set of judges who are watching the videos and giving you rounds of feedback, um, and from there, we choose eight to ten finalists, um, and in about the first or second week of April, those eight to ten finalists get up uh, in the stage and over in Wu and Chen, and they pitch their ideas in front of a live panel of judges. Um, we, we bring about five or six judges in from across the East Coast to, to judge the ideas. And they also give all their feedback. So Yeah, and, and yeah. the top three teams uh, win 20 grand in prizes. And there are also named prizes, like sponsored by co companies. So, you know, RJ Metrics or Mentor Tech. Um, these are all sort of local Philly companies. Um, they sponsor prizes as well. So again, applications, they're going to open on January 14th, and they'll close on February 12th, of course. We'll be sending you guys a couple of emails to uh, remind you guys to apply. Is there any questions? We'll open up. Yep. Uh, our slide application isn't uh, a process where we have to present it to you, right? You just email it. You just submit it via this online portal that we'll be sending out. You should provide enough detail in your slides so that you, the judges can have an idea of who you're gonna, what your product is, who is working on it, what the market for your product is, and kind of an idea of how you go about creating the prototype, doing all that, and um, 
like maybe some, if you can come up with financials, it's not necessary to come up with financials at that stage, but um, you definitely want to make sure that you have like team market sizing. Yeah, two things to add to that. First, um, having sort of like a game plan, even if you're super early stage, being able to articulate what your vision is in terms of a timeline is pretty important. So I don't care if it's the first round or the second round or the final round. Um, you want to be able to set milestones and say, yeah, by this date in 2015, we want to have this much in revenue, or by this date, we want to have a fully functional prototype. So I think milestones are something that the judges are really looking for. Um, and the second thing uh, about the team, which Guthrie spoke to, so typically that's going to be the last or second last uh, slide in the presentation. Um, our criteria, you can have as many team members as you'd like, and only one of them has to be a Penn student. I don't, you know, doesn't have to be engineering. You can be in any school, graduate, undergrad. Um, so it's it's pretty easy. They can be from Drexel or whatever. <laughs> We actually encourage people to participate in other pen competitions. Um, so yeah, if you have an idea for pen apps, like I guess this is for a lot of people who weren't here, but if you weren't interested in penvention, and then you had an idea for pen apps, and then you wanted to submit that to penvention, you could do that. Or, or if, if you have a tech-related project for Wharton Business Plan, you know, by all means, you submit it here. Or if you're in senior design in engineering, uh, we made it such that you know you'll have plenty of time to submit that if you'd like. Any other questions? And you're always free to email me or Ben. I promise we'll get back to you. Yeah. Um, we'll, we're going to be asking you to fill out a form on your way out just so that we can, if you need to get in touch with us, we'll have your info and you'll have ours. All right. And we also got free sandwiches and drinks outside. So have at it. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>